Loft conversions have become more popular in the last few years and there have been changes to the building control process and regulations. A loft conversion is the extension of a dwelling's habitable area into the loft space. You may need planning approval for this work and it's the responsibility of the homeowner to check if this is required. Any extension into the loft space will require building regulation approval and we always advise getting professional guidance regarding the proposed work. Before you start, you'll need to appoint a principal designer who has the necessary experience and competence to plan, manage and monitor the design phase of the project. This may be, but is not limited to, an architect or a specialist loft conversion firm who has the competency to undertake design work. It is the responsibility of a domestic client to ensure any principal designer, designer, principal contractor or contractor that they appoint is competent to undertake the work that they have been appointed to complete. As a domestic client, if you appoint an incompetent builder or designer, the responsibility rests with you. Once the principal designer has been appointed, they can advise you of your responsibilities as a domestic client and outline the various specialists you are likely to need during the project. Things to check include whether you need planning permission, whether a party wall agreement with your neighbours is required, whether your budget is realistic, and whether you've allowed realistic time to design and construct the works. It is also the responsibility of the client to ensure any principal contractor employed is competent to undertake the building work. Your principal designer can advise you regarding assessment of a builder's competency. It's recommended that you agree a written contract with your builder which covers payment terms, starting completion dates and references the architect's and engineer's drawings. Contract templates are available online. The contract should describe the builder as the principal contractor and reference their obligations within the building regulations. Around this time, you will also need to appoint a registered building control approver. The existing ceiling joists to the dwelling are likely to need strengthening or replacing as the new room will need to support the floor, the walls, ceilings and wall linings, insulation, furniture, bathroom fittings and people. The amount of strengthening work required would need to be assessed and designed by a structural engineer. The existing walls, openings and foundations of the dwelling will also have to be assessed to determine whether they can transfer the new loads down to the existing foundations. This may require some additional strengthening work within the existing dwelling. The existing roof rafters and joists may also need to be strengthened or replaced. A ridge beam is often required if existing purlins, ties and props are removed to make space for the new rooms. Some dwellings will have truss roofs and the removal of these trusses will need to be carefully considered by the structural engineer. All structural works must be designed to meet Part A requirements. When undertaking a loft conversion, fire safety is critical. The provisions required are determined by the floor height of the topmost floor. Most typical loft conversions result in a top floor height between 4.5 meters and 7.5 meters. In this case, the existing staircase will need to be upgraded to form a fire protected escape route from the new habitable rooms to a final exit, which should not be an escape window. Any existing doors at ground and first floor level, which form part of this escape route, will need to be replaced or upgraded to a suitable fire door. Fire door guidance is detailed in Appendix C of Approved Document B, Volume 1. Typically, to ensure best practice, fire doors or frames should be fitted with intermittent seals, but they do not need self-closing devices, smoke strips or brushes, unless the door is to a garage. 
Mains operated interlinked smoke detectors should be fitted at every landing level and the ground floor entrance hallway. This should be designed in accordance with the guidance in approved document B. Any glass in the walls or doors within the fire protected escape route would need to be replaced or upgraded to 30 minute fire resistant glass. If the dwelling is terraced or semi detached, any existing party wall between properties would need to be checked. Where necessary, it should be upgraded to provide 60 minutes fire separation. For any dormer close to a property boundary, external fire protection would need to be considered. Where the boundary is within one meter, fire resistance should be provided internally and externally. For buildings with a top floor height above 7.5 meters, specific provisions such as sprinklers would be required and specialist advice will be needed. If the dwelling is terraced or semi-detached, it may be necessary to improve the sound insulation within the loft space between adjoining properties. Any new wall that separates a bathroom from a bedroom or staircase should be filled with at least 25mm thick mineral wall insulation to reduce sound transfer between rooms. The new floor that separates the loft conversion from the existing dwelling should include at least 100mm thick mineral wall insulation. All sound insulation should be designed in accordance with approved document E. Approved document F states that all new habitable rooms should have opening windows that are at least 1 20th or 5% of the room's floor area. Background or trickle vents are required to every bedroom and bathroom, sized at 8,000 mm squared for bedrooms and 4,000 mm squared for bathrooms. If bathrooms do not have external walls or trickle vents cannot be installed, the area of trickle vents in the bedroom should be increased by 4,000 mm squared. Mechanical extract fans are required to bathrooms and ensuites rated at 15 litres per second. A staircase to the new floor of the dwelling, complying with park care requirements, will be needed. There are specifications for the rise, the pitch and the going of the staircase. The maximum rise of each step should be 220 millimeters and the minimum going of each step should be 220 millimeters. But the pitch should not exceed 42 degrees. So either rise or going would have to be less or greater than 220 millimeters. If using open risers, these should be constructed so that a 100 millimeter diameter sphere cannot pass through any gaps. A minimum two meters headroom should be provided from the pitch line and landings to the ceiling above. A reduced headroom of between 1.8 meters and 1.9 meters is permitted to staircases within loft conversions. See diagram 1.4 on screen now. Clear landings at least the same width as the staircase should be provided at the top and bottom of the stairs. Doors should not open or swing onto the top landing and should not open or swing within 400 millimeters of the bottom tread. A handrail should be provided to one side of the stairs at 900 millimeters above the pitch line. Guarding or balustrades are needed to any open side of the staircase and landings. They should be 900 millimeters high and constructed so that a 100 mm diameter sphere cannot pass through any gaps. They must not be easily climbable by children under five years old. Guarding or balustrades to external balconies should be 1100 mm high. Horizontal guarding or balustrades to open edges or landings are not permitted. Any openable window within 800 mm of an upper floor should be guarded with a barrier to prevent falling. This does not apply to roof windows. Safety glass should be provided to any window or glazed door within 800 millimeters of a floor or within 300 millimeters of a door. Alternating tread stairs or paddle stairs can be used in one or more straight flights. They are only permitted where there is not enough space 
for a standard staircase to be installed. And they provide access to only one habitable room and if required, a bathroom and or WC. In this case, handrails should be provided to both sides of the staircase and treads should have slip resistant surfaces. All new walls, roofs and exposed floors of loft conversions should be insulated. This is likely to be between rafters and below rafters to provide the required thermal performance. Dwarf walls within an attic space will also need insulating to complete the thermal envelope. Any exposed ceiling within a loft space should also be insulated. Windows, roof windows and external doors to balconies should be double or triple glazed to the U-value specifications found in approved document L. Any new electrical or gas work would need to be certified by a suitably qualified electrician or gas engineer. On completion of the works, the client, principal designer and principal contractor are required to give a declaration to the building control authority to confirm compliance with the new duty holder and competency regime and to confirm that their element of works comply with the building regulations. Throughout the process, you should expect your registered building control approver to undertake several inspections to determine compliance and to be able to issue a final certificate. As a registered building control approver with years of experience in loft conversions, you can appoint us to undertake the approval work. Our details are on screen now. Thanks for watching.